So good evening again, and I praise God for the fellowship we enjoy together. It's great to be together with uh, believers in the Lord, especially when it comes to evening service where the afternoon is so tiring, the temptation to stay at home and have a snooze or put your feet up or something. You say, no, nah, I'll go to church anyway. So I praise God for you. Now, Arabic service, we have an English and Arabic service in Sydney. In the Arabic countries, they used to have a morning service and in the evening they go on visitation. So they're not, it's not normal for them to have evening services. But I praise God for those who in, in Australia, it's what I normally do. And I think it's a benefit because you can't have enough of God's word. You can't. And it's a wonderful way of getting it. It just makes us stronger to serve God. We're going to turn uh, this evening to Psalm 142. And with food cooking, it'd be a cardinal sin to be long in preaching. Is that right? You can't be long in preaching or you burn the roast. And that's definitely a sin. I saw Gabby uh, with boxing gloves on when I came in this afternoon. I think, mate, don't stuff Gabby up tonight. She'll get you for sure. So Psalm 142. I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. For my spirit was overwhelmed within me. Then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walk, have they privily laid a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, but there was no man that would know me. Refuge failed me, no man kept for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord, I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. I tend under my cry. For I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. For the righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. Let's bow for prayer, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word and the privilege we have, Lord, to have the freedom to read it. And thank you for your Holy Spirit who illuminates our mind and understanding to be able to understand it. May this passage tonight be understood by each one of us here. May it turn us, our hearts unto thee because of it. To the Christ name we pray. Amen. Topic tonight is God alone. God allowed David to go through many trials while he was preparing him to become king over Israel. And he was to become the greatest of Israel's kings. He's the one through whom Christ would come. He would be conquering all enemy nations round about He'll bring peace to Israel while with himself there'll be no peace. He'd constantly be warring and warring and fighting. Even when he was going to die, there was internal warring between his son Solomon and Adonijah, who's going to be the next, next king in Israel. His whole life was spent fighting God's battles. Therefore, he need rigorous training to prepare him for this. So the very, very first, before he was even called to be anywhere near, uh, not to be king, he, as a shepherd, he was to defend his flock against a lion and a bear that came against him. And uh, then after anointing to be king, we find victorious over Goliath. And then we find, again, uh, serving King Saul. And for he, for King Saul, he was serving him and fighting Saul's battles. And he was being trained to be someone who's going to be a fighter in life. Now, Saul was someone whom David respected and loved very much. When Saul died, he said, how are the mighty fallen? He cried for Saul because he respected this man greatly. He followed him, he served him, he, he, his son Jonathan was his best friend, his daughter Michaela was his wife, but then saw through envy and jealousy, persecuted David. So he, the one he respected most in life, looked up to in life like a father, went against him because David was righteous and Saul wasn't. Because David followed God and Saul ceased to. Because David was blessed by God, not by but not, not, not he. And also... David had God's spirit, but God's spirit left Saul. So we find in this passage over here, a king, Saul, with all his glory, power, and possessions, was jealous of a servant. Why? Because the servant had God and he didn't. Now, understand something. Having God in your life is what matters. This is what's very, very important. God in your life is all that matters because God is able to turn circumstances around and give you grace at the time of need. Without God, we left to our own, circuit, own, own uh, defenses, our own strengths, our own uh, understanding. That's all we left to. And that is pathetic because we don't know the future. We're, we're not all powerful, all knowing. We're not there at all. We're limited. So we need someone who has no limitation to protect us. We're told a situation where Lazarus 
uh, and the rich man. The story about them where a rich man caring for his riches and Lazarus had nothing, had nothing. And the implication was Lazarus was a righteous man. A rich man was just simply too occupied with money. When they both died, they were there, where their ends come up, where we find Lazarus goes to be with the Lord in paradise and rich man wakes up in hell. Only, only God can make a difference in our life. In Psalm 142, we find this psalm was, was um, uh, preserved. This psalm was a remembrance of the time where David fled from Saul and all of his other troubles he went through. And here we learned there's three lessons. The first thing is this. In times of trouble, you can always turn to God. That's a very important thing because God is never, ever, ever away or gives a deaf ear to anyone who talks to him in prayer by faith and comes to God. Never. Even when a sinner repents from his sinfulness and turns to God, God hears him. So God is always, always there in times of trouble. You find your friends, they might not be able to help. Your parents can be too far. Even wives and husbands don't understand. When it comes to God, different. He's always there. And here we're told in this passage where David said, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. Now, the word cry means to cry out aloud. It's like to shrink from anguish or, or anguish or danger. Now, normally prayer is something we say in whispers, very quietly. When Hannah wanted to ask God for a child in the temple, her lips were moving, nothing coming out. Her heart was crying out to God, but in her mouth, nothing happens. And you find God, he's very well. He doesn't need us to shout. So when we have our time of prayer, we sit down, quietly talk to the Lord. But in seasons of distress, we become very emotional and we don't notice that we're raising our voice. We just don't notice it. Either excitement or emotion, we find ourselves screaming out to God. All formality is forgotten completely because of the situation in life. And we find out that David's life is at danger. He lost his calm and crying out to God aloud. And it says he, he cried out with his voice, with my voice. People many times ask others, pray for me, please, pray for me, please. And that's good. That's biblical. James 5.14, is there any sick among you? Call for the elders. Let them come, anoint him with oil, and then the prayer of faith shall so raise the sick. It's very important that we get people who are men and women of prayer and people walking with God say, please pray for me. That's wonderful. If there's a problem, I'll tell you. Say, look, you want me to pray for you? Why don't you fix your life up first? They'll be honest with us. Or they'll say, yes, they'll be very, very happy to. And there comes a time where God says, okay, that's fine for them to pray, but I want you to pray too. I want you to spend some time in crying out. I want you to agonize a little bit. I want you to suffer a little bit in prayer. I want you to be on your knees. I want you to close your eyes and I want you to come close to me. Sometimes it's what God does. And it's important to understand that. God wants to establish a relationship with each one of us. He does this through circumstances. This morning we learned to look at Daniel a little bit. In Daniel chapter 2, how he and his friends went to be with the, spoke with the Lord about uh, Nebuchadnezzar's, Nebuchadnezzar's dream. In chapter 9, we find Daniel was reading the prophecy of Jeremiah. And he read how Jeremiah said, 70 years Israel will be captive in Babylon. And he thought, what happens after that, God? What happens after that? So in a season of prayer, he went to pray to God and God told him after one day what's going to happen about Israel's future. And then we're told in chapter 10 of Daniel that he had these visions about the future, thinking, what's all this about? And he's over there praying to God for three weeks, continual prayer before God comes and gives him an answer. Now, there's times where we need to get on our knees and talk to God ourselves. Jeremiah 29 verse 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me, when shall search me with all thine heart. Now, God isn't far from anyone who really wants him. But those who come to him in a mechanical way, a religious way, sit down on the knees, make their morning prayers, evening prayers, and rattle off a few good words, and there's no heart involved, I'm sorry, there's no reception. But God wants us to come to him sincerely. Uh, in 1 Peter 5, 7, God says, casting all your care upon him, for he cares for you. So an open open up his heart and poured out all the problems that were uh, fermenting inside of him, David found releasing God. Now today we find it's normal with our situation around us, the distress and pressure, insecurity, with the COVID-19 issues, with a lot of people in confusion and uh, very, very hurtful, they're losing jobs and losing money, bankruptcy and people just being locked in there and scared to put their head outside. And um, we have one guy come to church the very first day it started, and I went to shake his hands. Oh, no, we don't do that. We don't do that. We don't do that. I'm thinking, 
Yesterday you did, and today you don't. What, because someone said something? And the very same day in the kitchen, he put his hand in the garbage can and pushed the rubbish down the bin. And I'm thinking, you shoved your hand in the garbage bin, but you won't shake mine? And I'm thinking, what happened? I was scared. I was scared. Well, you find a lot of things today cause people to worry and anguish. So what do you do? You sit at home and bite your, bite your fingernails or something? Hezekiah was besieged by uh, Assyria. His first response is in, in uh, 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 1, he went to the temple. The very first thing. And then he wrote a letter to Isaiah saying, Isaiah, please pray for us. Why? You're the prophet of God. So wonderful. He went to the temple, had the prophet of God pray. Then he prayed to God. Had all points covered completely. Because you realize God is the answer. Now, people today, the normal thing is, if you're sick, run to some pill somewhere, run to a doctor somewhere. These things are instruments that God uses, but they don't replace God. A pill won't work unless God makes it work. Doctor's advice won't work unless God makes it work. So we go and take a pill, I trust God the pill's going to work. I see a doctor and I trust God what he says is going to work. So my trust is in God, not in his remedy, in God. Because God's remedy will change from day to day. When people in the wilderness and they ate manna, they trusted in God, not the manna. They said, God, you want to make this thing work for me and keep me, keep me okay and safe. So it's very important to understand that we put our trust in God, depend on him, not on the instruments that God uses. Now, first thing over here we note that we can go to God anytime. He's always, always, always available. Second thing it is, only God knows what we're going through, verses 3 and 4. And this is very true. No one understands you as well as God. No one knows what you're capable of. No one knows what you're going through. No one knows what's in your mind, what you're thinking, what you're troubled with, and all the issues in that. They don't know you're distressed, but he does. We find that David, hunted by Saul, fine. He ran away from hiding place to hiding place, okay. And no matter where he went, someone's going to dob him in and show him where he, where he is. And then he, and David said, thou knowest my path. You know what I'm going through. There was no man to turn, turn to. And you stop and think, maybe God engineered all this. Maybe God engineered all this very, very thing. You stop and think about Israel when they come out of Egypt. God brought them out. Wonderful. You take them to the promised land? No. Why? Oh, they might go to the land of Philistines and see war and run back again. So God took them down south instead of up, up east. And he came to the Red Sea. When he came to the Red Sea, mountain on the left-hand side, mountain on the right-hand side, behind them is how they came in and the sea in front of them. They're blocked in on purpose. Then God woke up Pharaoh and says, come on, Pharaoh, chase after them. And Pharaoh gets his army and chases after them. So here's Israel as a sitting duck. Pharaoh's coming after them. And he, Pharaoh, thinking, what are we going to do? Obviously, press the panic button. They pass, what's going on? Moses knew what happened. He prayed to God and God delivered them. And then he took them out, three days journey in the wilderness. They go to a place called Mara. Water over there, they can drink and feed all their, uh, water all their people and the animals. They get there and the water's bitter. You think it's undrinkable or it's not very nice? What's going on? Press the panic button again. And God's saying, hey, I'm with you, aren't I? I just gave 10 plagues to free you out of Egypt. I opened the road for the Red Sea and now you're waiting again. So he makes the water sweep by, by throwing a bush in there. Then in the, in the desert, there's no food. And there's no food. So well, there's nothing to eat. And they start complaining. So God gives them manna, miracle food out of heaven that lasted for over 40 years. And just to, just to uh, increase the menu, he brought quail in to feed all the nation of Israel on that one time. After this, they kept walking towards Rephidim, no water. And they complained to God, no water. You think, why are you winching all the time when time after time after time God's coming to your rescue, giving you everything you need? Why do you have to winch first before God gives you what you're after? Why not trust in him? I mean, by experience, you've learned, trust in him. And so Moses goes down to Mount Horeb, which is Sinai, smites the rock, water comes down, waters all the people completely, and they feel better. Now, what, why is all this happening? In Deuteronomy chapter 8, verse 1 to 5, God tells us plainly why he's doing all this. And it's not an accident. All the commandments which I command thee this day shall be observed to do, that ye may live and multiply and go in and possess the land which the Lord swore unto your fathers. And thou shalt remember the, all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these forty years in the wilderness to humble thee, 
and to prove thee and to know what was in thine heart, whether thou wouldest keep his commandments or no. And he humbled thee, and he suffered thee to hunger, and fed thee with manna, which thou knewest not, nor did thy fathers know, that he might make thee to know that man doth not live by bread only, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of, mouth of the Lord doth man live. Thy raiment was not old upon thee, nor did thy foot swell these forty years. Now, here he says in these passages, I took you in the wilderness in the hard way. I caused you to hunger. I caused you to thirst. So you will understand. Your food's provided, your water's provided, your clothes provided by following my word, not by following yourself. Now, he took him 40 years in the wilderness to learn this lesson. That no matter what you have in life, you follow me, not your understanding. You follow me and I'll give everything you need. Okay? Because no one can substitute for me. Imagine a whole nation in the wilderness. No shops anywhere, no food anywhere. They can't feed their feet off the ground. You know, animals might, might get some grass off of that, but man, nothing. And yet God kept them 40 years. Man, if he can do that to those people, he can do that to you and I. We have no cause of fearing, where's my food going to come from when God's around? In um, uh, Matthew uh, 6.33, Seek ye first. The kingdom of God is righteousness. All these things, these petty things, your food, your clothing, everything. Have you added unto you? Nothing. We're told about Hannah being barren. Peninnah had children. And Peninnah provoked her again and again and again. So she felt so, so, so bad that she went and prayed. Now, well, in other words, if she wasn't provoked, 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 would she have prayed? She may have accepted her circumstance. Israel besieged by the Syrian army. And they were locked up in the city in Samaria, and there was great famine in the city because the Syrians were outside, and there was no help, no food, no hope. And it was so, so bad that two women came, came to complain to the king. One woman said, Listen, we made an agreement saying, We'll eat my son today, and we'll eat your son tomorrow. Well, we ate my son today, but she hid her son. Go tell her to bring her son out so we can eat him. You see, out in the open. And the king is so angry, he said, Man, We're going to kill that. Elisha, they'll blame him, obviously. If something goes wrong, you blame God, you blame your servant. I'm going to kill him. Elisha said, listen, tomorrow, everything back to normal. I said, well, God opens windows in heaven. Is this possible? Next day, we find absolutely God works that out. If you want to find out, read in the Bible, okay? I'm not going to tell you where it is. You'll find out in the Old Testament. Second Kings, it's there for you to read. The apostles, in a storm, fearing they would drown, Jesus Christ asleep. He stayed asleep. Why? I think the storm would have woken him up. Sure would have woken him up. He wasn't worried. He can teach him a lesson. And when they absolutely got to their very, very end, saying, Lord, care us now that we perish, he got up and said, Please be still. And they thought, Wow, they learned something about Jesus they didn't know before. He had power over nature. And so we find that God engineers our circumstances and trials and problems to show us something about himself that he could not show us otherwise. So we're learning a whole lot from our trials. You find, as you grow older and older in the Lord, you become more and more at peace with the Lord because you realise, no matter what I go through, God's going to take care of things. He will take care of things. You get experience, realise, well, no matter what I've gone through before, God led me through it, so I'll do the same thing today. God knows the path we walk. He knows the difficulties. He knows the trials we're going to face. And he'll never, ever leave us nor forsake us. Never. But he will cause us to get on our knees. He will cause us to trust in him. And that's his purpose. So we find the, the first lesson, we're supposed to turn to God in times of trouble. Second lesson, only God knows what we're going through. And finally, God is all we need. This is very important. We sometimes think God is the person you go to for spiritual things, but there must be another avenue for physical things. Because God, you can't see him, he's a spirit. So there must be some other area for, for, physical, for physical things. Here we're told in verse 5, God is our refuge. Now, you'll have snowstorms, you'll have floods, you'll have earthquakes. And when they come along, people seek refuge. They want to have someplace warm from the snow, someplace dry from the floods, someplace safe from earthquakes. And they want to stay in that place until the storm, the flood, the earthquake goes away. They don't take away the problem. They just give you safety through the problem. He's saying, God is my refuge. When all these troubles are happening all around me, 
God is my place of safety. So if they're staying the way they are and not changing, God is my safety. I can endure any trial through God. Philippians 4.13, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. Or I can endure all circumstances through Christ who gives me power too. So it's very important to understand this thing. In Psalm 46, verse 1 to 3, these Psalms are beautiful for giving us advice in times of trouble. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, will we not fear? Though the earth be removed, so the mountains be car carried into the midst of the sea, so the waters thereof roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with the swelling thereof. Now, why won't we worry? Because God's our refuge. Very simple, God's our refuge. He's the one who keeps me, he cares for me, he provides for me. In verse 10 it says, be still and know that I am God. Very, very important. So uh, we find God's purpose is not to take away our storms sometimes, but to provide us with a warm, dry, safe place to weather out the storm. With King David, uh, he had, or David, David was simply uh, uh, being an outlaw from Saul. Saul had a long period of time of chasing him, maybe years, of chasing him completely, completely, and it was God's will that happened. It was God's will that that happened. Now, David was learning. It's not the presence of Saul that was a problem. It's the presence of God. If God was present, Saul's no issue. If God's present, the, the storms aren't any issue. And that's something we have to learn. We walk by faith and not by sight. We trust in God and not in some quick fix solution. We don't want quick fix solutions because they don't strengthen anyone. They don't make you stronger for the next one. They make you look for shortcuts all the time. If I get a quick fix and it solves my problem today, I want a quick fix tomorrow and a quick fix next day. I don't want something stable, something long-term, something permanent. I want something that's short-term so I can get it out of my trouble straight away. That's what people look for we're not concerned about God. But if you want God in your life at every circumstance, you got to do it his way. you got to do it his way. Christ said in John 15, abide in me and my word abides in you. Without that, you can do nothing. You can do nothing. Simply, look at this, he says. I am the vine, you are the branches. While you're abiding in me, you'll bear fruit. If you don't abide in me, you won't bear fruit. Can you miss that analogy? Impossible. A branch by itself can't be fruitful. It'll die, die and wither away. But whilst joined onto the vine, when the sap of that vine comes into the branch, it's going to bear fruit. So who does the fruit bearing? The branch? No, 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 no. The vine does. Or the, uh, the branch is the instrument through which it bears fruit. And so Christ is telling us, if you want to be fruitful, just abide in me. Just stay close to me. So we're told very, very plainly, we stay close to God. There's no alternative to him that we find we do bear fruit. In Psalm 91, we find the, the same themes repeated again and again in the Psalms. Verse 1 to 4. He that dwelleth in the secret place of the Most High shall abide under the shadow of the Almighty. Hey, stop and think. The person who stays close to God abides under his protection, his refuge. Just stay close to God. You abide under that protection. Verse 2. I'll say to the Lord, He is my refuge and my fortress, my God, in whom I trust. Surely He shall deliver thee from the snares of the fowler and from the noise of pestilence. He shall cover thee with His feathers, and under His wings shalt thou trust. His truth shall be thy shield, my buckler. So we find in God we have this refuge. And He also said, You are my portion in land of living. Now, with the refuge, we find this protection. With the God being our portion, we find this position. Now, the, this, this idea of portion or inheritance, uh, chose was in the Old Testament where God chose Israel or chose the Levites from Israel. He said, listen, you guys will be mine. You can't have lands inherited. You'll have villages to live in and cities to live in, a small parcel of land to have your little veggie garden. But that's it. You won't have great big fields and flocks and herds, okay? Your job is simply to serve me in the word of God and the ties of people, that'll be your, your food. He said, listen, people, I am your inheritance. You don't get land, you get me. And uh, that was what they learned, that God was their inheritance. Again and again, he told them, I am your inheritance. In Psalm 23, 1, David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Because God is my shepherd, and David knew what a shepherd does, I will never be in need. 
because he will care for me and guide me and protect me. So we find that if we look upon God as our portion, that all we need in life. Now, David was a multi-millionaire as king in Israel. He said, Lord, you're my inheritance. Not this money in the bank. You're my inheritance. It's all I need. Money is limited in what it can do. It can't get you out of distress. Oh, well, it makes it smoother or easier. Uh -uh. Next one comes along in the same trouble again. But God comes along, gives you peace inside completely. With that peace inside of you, you're able to withstand anything that comes your way. I mean, anything. You read about people, uh, missionaries, uh, Cuts and Taylor. This guy went through a horrific time in China. He served God for over 50 years in the, in the missionary field in China in the midst of wars and diseases through the death of his children, finally the death of his wife, Mary. He went through such horrific things. He was in his own body. He was sick, had to go back to England for 12 months to get recuperated again, to go back on the field again. This guy was non-stop, absolutely non-stop. But because his heart was in the Lord, his trust in the Lord, he was able to withstand every and all trials, not just financial, though the minimum thing, but the, the things, the emotional, I mean, losing his wife, losing his kids and continuing for the Lord non-stop his devotion to god never wavered whatsoever and why was that well, he realized god is my portion i don't want anything else i want nothing but god you can take away everything physical from me but i'll have god that satisfies me because god cannot be taken away from we find abraham left Ur the chaldees had a home over there the guy was rich over there and he went around to some place they've been to before called canaan and now he finds his cane. God says, see this land of East, yeah? Now, you're going to inherit that one day, but you'll never, your kids will. I mean, the only block of land he had in his name was one that he bought and paid for. The cave of Machpelah, the burial, burial place for his wife and himself and Isaac and Jacob and their wives. That's the only place he had for himself because he paid for it. But that's his inheritance. But he went over there, wandered around the place, backwards and forwards, backwards and forwards. The Bible says he was looking for his city whose builder and maker was God. His whole idea was, I'm going to dwell with God. I'm going to stay close to him. And so we find that that's not, that's not unusual. The apostles, when Jesus Christ came along, they had to leave their homes, leave their place of employment, leave their type of lifestyle, leave the desire to make possessions and money and follow him. And that's what they did. That was a requirement. The apostle Paul, he did the exact same thing. He said, you know, for me to live is Christ, to die is gain. He said, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, nevertheless, I live in an eye, but Christ liveth in me. Now, the Apostle Paul was someone who realized Jesus Christ had to be first and nothing else really mattered. I press toward the mark for the prize, the high crown of God in Christ Jesus. That was his goal. I want to be more and more and more Christ-like. I want to be closer to him and closer to him and closer to him. That was David's desire. David would rather stay in the temple of God than to be a king. He'd rather, he'd rather, if God said, listen, what do you want to be, a king or priest? I'll be a priest, thanks. Why? We're not going to be in the temple all the time. His heart was with the Lord completely. So we find that God is reachable at any time whatsoever. We find that God knows the situation we're in, and we find that only God can help us. So the whole idea is this. Put God as number one priority in your life. How do I do that? Well, you've got to start by having devotions. You've got to start by repenting from a worldly lifestyle. You've got to start by disowning mammon, thinking money will help, possessions will help. Get away from that. Ask yourself this. If I was offered a million dollars to miss church one Sunday, would I take it? Hey, not bad, eh? I'm not going to offer it to you. Imagine it's only one week. I've been sick before. I missed church before. A million dollars miss one Sunday. Would I take it? The answer is yes. Then the God of Mammon has got you. I mean, it's very, very simple. Just miss church one Sunday. It's, it's, it's screened already. You watch it at home on TV. If that is that going to tempt you to do this church, then you got the God of Mammon has you. See, it doesn't have to be. You don't have to have a high price to be under the God of Mammon. Very low price is fine. No, no, no. We need to understand, we want God. He's all we need in life. God alone. If you want God, you have everything. Okay? You've got everything. You have Christ as Savior. You have every promise in the Bible. You have the Holy Spirit indwelling inside of you. You've got all the promises of God. He'll never leave you nor forsake you. You've got everything.
and he'll provide for you. Absolutely. So all we need is God. Let's go up and pray, please. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word, for its instruction, and thank you, Lord, for making yourself real to us through David and his circumstances, through Israel and their plight, Lord. Thank you, Lord, through the apostles and through uh, Paul, to everyone in the scriptures, Lord, who turned their heart toward thee and they proved thee and found thee faithful. Thank you, Lord God. We know at the very, very end result, you're the one who's going to take us into heaven, into a wonderful paradise prepared for us, which will last for eternity. And all our problems and trials on earth will be so minimal, we'll just forget them and never regard them at all. The suffering of this present time not worthy to compare to the glory which shall be received in us in heaven. So we thank you for your word. Give us the grace, Lord, to turn to you, to trust you, to abide in you, Lord, and to thank you that you'll never leave us nor forsake us. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen.